When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989 and the Soviet Union followed it into the dustbin of history two years later, American conservatives were taken by surprise. They'd been so afraid of communist power for so long, despite their constant assertion that it was a hopelessly inefficient system, that they were slow to accept the evidence coming out of Eastern Europe. Still, they felt vindicated, especially when newly opened Soviet archives proved that many of the Americans they had long suspected of espionage had indeed been Soviet spies. America was left now as the world's sole superpower. Should it withdraw into itself and resume the historic foreign policy of isolationism? Or should it now try to exert its power to change the rest of the world in ways consonant with American beliefs and interests? Neoconservatives favoured the second alternative. Heirs of the older conservative tradition favoured the former. Almost at once, the United States faced a decision when Saddam Hussein of Iraq invaded Kuwait. America decided to take the interventionist path. President George Bush I responded by building an anti-Iraq alliance through the United Nations and invading Kuwait to repel the invader. Neoconservatives were gratified, though some thought that Bush had missed an opportunity to overthrow Hussein once and for all. Meanwhile, two persuasive neoconservative writers offered contrasting scenarios for the future. In The End of History, Francis Fukuyama anticipated a decline in global conflict, as all the nations of the world now agreed on the superiority of liberal democracy. Samuel Huntington, by contrast, feared a future of greater conflict, one he described as the coming clash of civilizations. Well, conservatives celebrated the demise of the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe in 1989, and then the collapse of the Soviet state itself in 1991. William Buckley, uh, writing in National Review, wrote, It was above all Ronald Reagan who turned the tide so that the prison sentence of the Eastern Europeans came to an end after 44 years. He did this by building up the military, by conceiving of Star Wars. And then Buckley went on to list the other ways in which um, Reagan had, had uh, put intolerable pressure on the Soviets, which, who, because of the weakness of their economy, simply couldn't keep pace. The, the introduction of cruise missiles and Pershing missiles into Europe, and then the, the uh, arming of the Taliban in Afghanistan to fight, off, uh, get, to fight back against the Russian incursion, in the end had simply been too much for the Soviet Union to be able to keep up with. The American conservatives felt vindicated in their belief that their own system was more durable, more prosperous and more prone to promote freedom and stability. From Russell Kirk and Whittaker Chambers on back in the 1950s, there had been a kind of gloomy pride among some conservative writers in seeing themselves as being on the side that was righteous, but also the side that was destined to lose. In fact, one of the strongest convictions all over the world had been, sooner or later, socialism is going to win. Among socialists, it had been an idea, an act of uh, a belief which they recognised with pleasure. Conservatives regarded it with gloom. But suddenly, it was a prediction which had proved to be completely false. And in fact, now the United States was left as an unrivaled economic and political superpower, more dominant than any predecessor. In fact, the end of communism even raised the possibility that anti-communism, the glue that had held the movement together over the preceding half century, was now gone, so that the movement might fragment. There was some truth to that assertion as well, as the events of the early 1990s soon showed. Now, some conservative writers were slow to be convinced that communism had genuinely perished. Norman Podhoretz, the influential editor of Commentary magazine, and to some extent William Buckley himself, had both been committed to the idea that reform inside a totalitarian system was impossible. This had been the view of Jean Kirkpatrick, which I read it to you in a previous lecture. Kirkpatrick had said, Authoritarian regimes sometimes reform themselves and mature into democracies, but totalitarian regimes never do. At the time she wrote it, in the late 1970s, that was true. But now, one part of that distinction was being falsified by events. 
And so at first, many of the conservative writers regarded Perestroika and Glasnost, the new uh, Soviet, uh, the, the, the freeing up of the Soviet regime uh, under Gorbachev, they saw them just simply as hypocritical sops to public opinion. But the events of 1989 were incontrovertible. It was no longer possible to deny that great changes really were taking place. The historian John Ehrman, who's done a close study on neoconservatives and foreign policy, writes this. As the Soviet Union and communism deteriorated in the late 1980s, at first slowly, but then with a rush after mid-1989, Pod Horace was robbed of his familiar world, left without direction, and saw his relevance decrease. Although Pod Horace was not the only foreign policy commentator overtaken by events and quickly confused, his long record of strident statements, marked by a tone of absolute certainty, left him with little cover for his misinterpretations. Well, further vindication for the conservative movement came in the form of the discovery that many Americans who'd been suspected of being Soviet agents back in the 1940s and 50s had indeed been Soviet agents and had been spying for the Soviet Union. The opening of the Soviet archives to, to Western historians was itself a great moment. Uh, the KGB archives had um, encyclopedic information about who'd been working for the Russians. And cases which had been agonized over in the McCarthy era, the case of Alger Hiss and the case of the Rosenbergs, for example, in which liberal intellectuals had passionately denied that they were spies, now showed that the allegations were true. There were some surprise new revelations as well, such as that the journalist I.F. Stone uh, had himself showed up in coded Soviet traffic. One of my own colleagues at Emory University, Harvey Clare, has been a leader in the, in the study of these spies. And uh, he's discovered that, among other things, the, the Soviet agents themselves had code names for all the people who were working for them, usually quite easily decipherable, and code names for places as well. He says they even had a certain grim humour. Their nickname for San Francisco was Babylon. Well, social conservatives warned that the end of the Cold War would be a bitter victory if the former Soviet countries adopted the worst characteristics of the Western democracies rather than their best characteristics. If the end of communism meant that now democ democracy could flourish and that Eastern Europe could become an area um, practicing liberal capitalism where it would enjoy freedom of speech and religion and an end to mutual espionage and the constant snooping which had been so characteristic of communist life, so much the better. But on the other hand, if it was a question of pornography and abortion and organized crime, then it was going to prove to be a very, very hollow victory indeed. Ralph McInerney, who was a conservative writer, uh, also a professor of philosophy at Notre Dame, wrote this. There are those who see what is happening in Eastern Europe as the desire for what is most loathsome in our own society. He said, political freedom is, of course, good, but the sexual revolution is disastrous. It is, quote, undoing the country because it symbolizes the belief that we can make up the rules. We can define what human nature is. We can defy the God who made us. So the question was, in what way would Eastern Europe go now? Would it adopt the best or the worst of what had been developing in the, in the West? Catholics and many evangelical Protestants as well had been highly inspired by the example of the Solidarity Movement in Poland, begun by Lech Walesa in the uh, Gdansk shipyards and then spreading across Poland and undermining the legitimacy of the old Polish communist regime. And it was particularly significant, particularly for the, from the Catholics' point of view, that the Pope, Pope John Paul II, should himself have been a Pole, in other words, should have come out of the heart of communist Eastern Europe and become a symbolic figure for the overthrow or the eventual overthrow of communism. Here's George Rutler, a Catholic convert and, and Catholic priest, uh, saying, uh, well, worrying about what's going to be the effect on Eastern Europe. He wrote, oppression in Eastern Europe has been the health of the church because at the heart of the faith is the cross, or in other words, suffering. In the West, we have lost the cross through indolence. Conservatives now debated whether the United States, after the long crises of opposing first Nazism and then communism, 
should now revert to the traditional conservative posture of isolationism, or whether the United States should now use its supremacy to transform the world on behalf of democratic capitalism. The paleoconservatives, that is to say the old conservatives, who uh, had been parts of the movement ever since the 1950s, led now particularly by Patrick Buchanan, strongly favoured the isolationist option. Buchanan became an important figure in the 1990s. He was a lifelong conservative writer and had been a speechwriter for President Nixon. In the Reagan White House, he'd been communications director, so he'd been very, very close to the practical side of conservative power and also to the intellectual side of it as a, as a constant prolific writer. His view was this. Even though American foreign policy had been active and international, world bestriding, since 1941, it was still an aberration from the tradition established by President Washington's farewell address, a policy to which the United States should now return. In other words, America should, should take the view, yes, we had to encounter a long-term crisis which lasted half a century, but nevertheless, now that crisis has come to an end and we can retreat back within ourselves. In total contrast to that view was the neoconservative view. They favoured a forward foreign policy. Influential neoconservative writers said, let's now seize the opportunity of unipolarity, that is of America being the one overwhelmingly strong nation in the world, to create conditions which are benign to America, but good for everybody else as well. In their view, all the world wants freedom and prosperity. We in America have got a system that creates those things, and so we should export it everywhere. This was a view epitomised in a book called Present Dangers, edited by William Crystal and Donald Kagan in 2000. William Crystal was the influential son of Irving Crystal, who'd been one of the founding members of the original neoconservative group. And in the, in the introduction to that book, they wrote, For the first time in its history, the United States has the chance to shape the international system in ways that would enhance its security and advance its principles without opposition from a powerful, determined adversary. They went on to say, the contributors were all conservative internationalists with a strong commitment to vigorous American global leadership, to American power, and to the advancement of American democratic and free market principles abroad. In this sense, they are true heirs to a tradition in American foreign policy that runs at least from Theodore Roosevelt through Ronald Reagan. So in other words, one of their first thoughts was to establish for themselves a conservative lineage in making the case democracy isn't just for us and free market capitalism isn't just for us, it's for everyone and it's our benevolent duty now to spread these things throughout the world. The Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990 just at the moment when the Soviet Union was unravelling, provoked the first crisis of the post-Cold War world. And so straight away the United States had to decide what it was going to do. President George H.W. Bush assembled a United Nations coalition and first imposed sanctions, specified to Saddam Hussein, the Iraqi dictator, that his, his forces would have to be withdrawn from Kuwait or more serious uh, reprisals would follow. When Saddam Hussein refused to withdraw, the United Nations forces invaded Kuwait uh, under American leadership and very, very rapidly expelled the invaders. Now, conservative intellectuals debated the theoretical issues raised by this war and their implications for America's future posture. Commentary magazine was particularly eager for a vigorous war policy and, characteristically, made the Nazi analogy. This is what Norman Podhoretz wrote, quote, When Hitler occupied the Rhineland in 1936, a moment which roughly corresponds to the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq, he had not yet attained to the level of evil Saddam Hussein has already reached in launching a pointless war against Iran that, caused a, that resulted in a million casualties, in using poison gas against his own Kurdish citizens, and in the grisly atrocities he has committed in Kuwait.
ever since World War II, uh, using analogies from the 1930s was one of the, uh, the, the, the preferred ways of thinking about conflicts. In other words, the lesson that nearly everybody drew from the late 30s was you mustn't appease the enemy because if you do so, he won't interpret that as a sign that everybody wants peace. No, he'll in interpret that as a sign that he can take advantage of your weakness to assert his own will. The great regret from the, po from the point of view of the commentary group was that President Bush didn't finish the job. Once the uh, Iraqis had been expelled from Kuwait, they left it at that. And some of the neoconservatives said, Bush should have invaded Iraq and destroyed the power of Saddam Hussein once and for all, and then should have imposed a more benign regime. Here's another commentary writer named Angelo Codevilla, and he writes, Saddam's regime may be compared to a bacterial infection that has been treated with enough antibiotics to make the patient feel better, but not enough to kill it. The patient has every reason to fear that in time, the infection will become will become more virulent and meet less resistance than before. By focusing on the Kuwaiti symptom rather than on the Iraqi disease, Bush put himself in the worst of positions. Well, many of the neoconservatives from that time on became especially eager to finish the job in Iraq, and the circumstances of the early 21st century, obviously, were going to give them their opportunity. Now, at the same time, Pat Buchanan and his supporters, the paleoconservatives, were very critical of this view and of all forms of worldwide adventures, which they saw as no longer necessary and certainly not consonant with American tradition. Here's Joseph Sobran, one of the senior editors at National Review, writing against the idea of a new internationalism. He wrote, With the end of the Cold War, conservatives ought to be redoubling their efforts to achieve the domestic goal of restoring a limited republic, not sacrificing this purpose to global empire. And he was outspokenly dismissive of commentary magazine's way of making Saddam what he called our new Hitler of the month. In other words, in Sobran's view, it's ever so easy simply to say of whoever you happen not to like, he's just like Hitler, and then go to war against them. Now this dispute within the conservative movement became particularly heightened because some, Jew some Jewish ne neoconservatives accused Pat Buchanan of anti-Semitism for his sharply anti-war position. At one point during this controversy, Buchanan wrote, There are only two groups that are beating the drums for war in the Middle East, the Israeli Defense Ministry and its Amen Corner in the United States. Buchanan described Congress at one point as Israeli-occupied territory. And he said that if America went to war, Israel would benefit, but the fighting would be done, quote, by kids with names like McAllister, Murphy, Gonzalez, and Leroy Brown. In other words, poor, ordinary poor Americans, minorities particularly, would be fighting not really for America's interests, but really for Israel's interests. Well, Buchanan's... Uh, outspoken anti-Israeli remarks were denounced by Norman Podhoretz and by other Jewish uh, commentators like Charles Krauthammer, prominent Jewish writers in public life. William Buckley, who'd long played the role of peacemaker within the conservative movement, intervened. In fact, he wrote a book-length study of the whole issue, critical of Buchanan for his tactlessness, but also critical of Jewish overreactions as he saw them. He insisted that criticism of the war and of Israel were permissible and did not necessarily connote anti-Semitism. Still, the intensity of this dispute was more even than the diplomatic Buckley could altogether settle. The foreign policy crises of the 1990s demonstrated that action and inaction could be equally perilous. For example, President Clinton, who was president from 1992 right through to the end of the century, was strongly criticised in some quarters when he did intervene in Bosnia and Somalia, and he was equally strongly criticised by others when he didn't intervene in Rwanda to prevent the genocide there. There was a feeling of widespread uncertainty at all points of the political compass in the 1990s about what were the appropriate principles to apply in the uses of American power. In every case, persuasive arguments could be made to intervene and to not intervene. That was one of the dilemmas of, the, of the, the sheer power which America now possessed. Conservative intellectuals disagreed about whether the end of communism promised a more peaceful world. 
or whether it promised the onset of more acute conflicts. And once again, persuasive voices could be heard from both sides. One of the most distinctive voices was that of Francis Fukuyama, who wrote a very, very influential essay called The End of History. He argued that all the world was now converging around systems of democratic capitalism. Fukuyama himself was a State Department official, and he published this essay in 1989 in Irving Kristol's magazine, The National Interest, which had been founded as a uh, foreign policy journal in 1985. And in fact had been one of the places which was more responsive to changes in the Soviet Union than some of the other American conservative publications had been. Here's a little passage from uh, Francis Fukuyama's The End of History. He says, The triumph of the West, of the Western idea, is evident in the total exhaustion of viable systematic alternatives to Western liberalism. So far, he said, the victory was chiefly in the realm of ideas. But, quote, there are powerful reasons for believing that liberal democracy is the ideal that will govern the material world in the long run. He was writing this even before the Berlin Wall fell, although the journal came out as that was happening. He added, Gorbachev has finally permitted people to say what they had privately understood for many years, namely that the magical incantations of Marxism-Leninism were nonsense. Fukuyama added, Many struggles against tyranny would continue, but the gradual trend all over the world was toward the liberal democratic ideal, which would bring peace and prosperity, and possibly even a much less interesting future. His, his title, The End of History, he, by that he wasn't implying that literally nothing else was going to happen at all, but simply that the kind of great catastrophic crises which have been characteristic of the history of the last two centuries were now much less likely because on the most essential points, everybody was agreed about what the world ought to be like. And there was nobody left who seriously believed in Marxism. A very different point of view was put forward by Samuel Huntington, a Harvard professor of politics. We met Huntington earlier. He was one of the early neoconservative writers who began making the case in the 1960s that America would benefit from having less people voting that far from getting every citizen involved in politics, let's have less action. Because by having less people, people involved, we'll have more political stability. Now, uh, thinking about foreign policy, he countered Fukuyama's idea and said, no, until now, conflicts have been chiefly confined to intra-Western affairs. But now they're going to give way to what he called a clash of civilizations. He said, think about the great conflicts of the last few centuries. First, there were conflicts between monarchies. Then there were conflicts between great dictatorships like communism and fascism. But in every case, these were Western ideas and Western powers which were conflicting with one another. Communism and fascism are both Western ideas. But now, other civilizations are catching up with the West technologically. And now the conflict is going to be more deep-seated. Huntington says this, the fundamental source of conflict in this new world will not be primarily ideological or primarily economic. The great divisions among humankind and the dominating source of conflict will be cultural. He argued that ideologies are comparatively shallow, but civilizations are deep, quote, differentiated from each other by history, language, culture, tradition, and most important, religion. These differences are the product of centuries. They are far more fundamental than differences among political ideologies and political regimes. He pointed out, for example, that it was possible uh, in, this, in the same time and place in Germany or Britain or America for, mem for one member of a family to choose to be a communist and another member of the same family to choose to be a fascist. That this was a, a repertoire of ideas which, strangely, all came from the same fount. But by contrast, the ideas between... Christians and Muslims were much more different. And he noted of Islam, for example, that the elites in the Islamic world were becoming de-Westernized, having once tried to borrow the energy of Western civilization. Now, he said, a process of civilizational rallying was taking place in which the elites of the different civilizations of the world were going back to the roots of those civilizations. He added, Western ideas of individualism, 
liberalism, constitutionalism, human rights, equality, liberty, the rule of law, democracy, free markets, the separation of church and state, often have little resonance in Islamic, Confucian, Japanese, Hindu, Buddhist or Orthodox cultures. And besides, the very notion that there could be a universal civilization is a Western idea. So there are two very, very different visions of what's going to happen. Fukuyama saying everyone wants to become more like the West, democratic capitalist. Huntington saying no, now, now that the West has settled its internal disputes, now we have the clash of civilizations. The events of the 1990s offered illustrative testimony to both theories. And if you had the two theories in mind and then watched what was going on, you could favor first one policy and then the other. For example, in Eastern Europe, there was a wave of democratization following the fall of the Soviet Empire. And that looked like a fulfillment of Fukuyama's idea, becoming more like the West. But on the other hand, the Balkan conflicts in the former Yugoslavia and the rise of militant Islam looked more like Huntington's prediction was coming true. But in any case, there was very little evidence to support Fukuyama's overstated idea that history itself was coming to an end. In domestic politics, a conservative revolt in 1992 contributed to the defeat of the first President Bush. He'd been a rival of Reagan in the 1980 primaries and back then had dismissed supply-side economics as what he called voodoo economics. Reagan had chosen him as vice presidential candidate, not because they were ide ideologically compatible, but because they weren't. It was a good way of strengthening uh, his appeal to moderate Republicans, who might otherwise have been hesitant to get on board. But nevertheless, after eight years as vice president, the first George Bush became the heir apparent and won the election of 1988 against Michael Dukakis, whose inept campaign probably culminated when he appeared looking slightly ridiculous inside a tank as a way of trying to show that he would be tough on defence questions. Early on, the first President Bush showed that he had the instincts of a political moderate. He called for, quote, a kinder, gentler America, which inadvertently implied that Reagan had been unkind and rough the first President Bush was very careful not to gloat over the end of the Cold War. He, he held out a hand of friendship to the, to the Russians as, it, as the Soviet Union broke up and the, uh, the post-Soviet regimes came into place, offered to help rather than taking advantage of the situation. He raised taxes despite a promise not to. And he was bitterly criticised from Reagan holdovers inside the administration and by, for example, William Crystal, Irving's son, whose nickname in those days was Dan Quayle's Brain. These were in the days when Dan Quayle was the vice president and William Crystal was his, his principal advisor and, according to Washington insiders, provided most of the intellectual voltage of the, of the, Quayle, uh, the Quayle vice presidency. Pat Buchanan entered the 1992 primaries against the first President Bush and did very well. So, in other words, just as Kennedy had violated the tradition of not challenging an incumbent back in 1980 on the Democratic side, so now Buchanan is challenging the tradition by entering the primaries on the Republican side. Buchanan, as we've seen, favoured reviving the ideas of America first. He was a protectionist. He was very, very anti-immigrant, uh, favouring a harsh policy against illegal immigrants from Central America. Once his candidacy had, uh, had been defeated, and once, the first, once George Bush was in fact re-nominated, Buchanan was invited to give the keynote speech at the Republican convention in 1992 in Houston. And Buchanan took the advantage of making a slashing attack on the Democrats, but also a kind of sly attack on President Bush, despite ostensibly saying that he was eager to reunite the party. This is what Buchanan said on that occasion. It is said that each president will be recalled by posterity with but a single sentence. George Washington was the father of our country. Abraham Lincoln preserved the Union and Ronald Reagan won the Cold War. And it is time my old colleagues, the columnists and commentators, looking down on us tonight from their anchor booths and skyboxes, gave Ronald Reagan the credit he deserves for leading America to victory in the Cold War. Most of all, Ronald Reagan made us proud to be Americans again. We never felt better about our country and we never stood taller in the eyes of the world. Well, it was Bush who'd actually presided over the end of the Cold War and so this emphatic uh, drawing of attention to Bush's immediate predecessor 
was simultaneously a, a boost for the party and a little bit of a sly dig at the expense of President Bush. To further complicate the election, a Texas multimillionaire named Ross Perot also entered the campaign, then dropped out, then re-entered, all of which cost President Bush votes. Bill Clinton, the Democratic candidate, won. He was the beneficiary of conservative splits and tensions. But despite these divisions, the conservative movement as a whole remained very, very healthy, latently extremely strong, as it demonstrated by winning an overwhelming victory in the midterm elections of 1994, when, for the first time since the 1950s, it gained control of both houses of Congress.